Hello and welcome everyone to the C.S. Lewis Foundation webinar series. It's our first it's our first webinar of 2021 and we want to welcome you here to uh, this wonderful space that we have carved out um, once a month to come and be encouraged in our walk with the Lord and in the life of the mind. Today may be your first C.S. Lewis Foundation uh, experience. So I want to tell you that the C.S. Lewis Foundation is inspired by the life and legacy of C.S. Lewis. We encourage and equip Christians to integrate their faith within the world of ideas and the arts. And in this new uh, land of COVID in which we're all trying to navigate, we uh, could not give up the thought of meeting together. We would prefer to be in the same room with you, uh, listening and laughing and in uh, enjoying food and drink together, but we do not want to give up meeting together. So this webinar uh, series is designed for us to continue to meet uh, virtually as it is, to continue to learn, to continue to feed our minds and our hearts by scripture and uh, together with the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to thank today's uh, webinar sponsor, Joshua George, and the others who have provided so generously for today's webinar to happen. We want to thank you for that. Thank you for uh, supporting the work of the C.S. Lewis Foundation in what we're doing together. So to the meat of today, today we are here to speak with our friend Patty Callahan Henry, author of the book, Becoming Mrs. Lewis. This is a beautiful cover here. Um, the unlikely love story between Joy Davidman and C.S. Lewis. Patty is a friend of ours. I'm going to find my bio from Patty. Here we are. Patty Callahan Henry is a New York Times bestselling author of 15 novels, including Becoming Mrs. Lewis. Uh, she's now a USA Today Publishers Weekly and Globe Mail bestseller and the recipient of the Christie Award for the 2019 winner of the Book of the Year. Patty is the host of uh, the popular seven-part original Behind the Scenes of Becoming Mrs. Lewis podcast series, and the audiobook for uh, Becoming Mrs. Lewis was released in January 2020. Her most recent books include The Favorite Daughter and The Perfect Love Song, both released in 2019. Patty, why don't you join me on screen here? Let's say hello. Patty's published in numerous languages, and her essays can be found in anthologies and collections such as Our Prince of Scribes, Southern Writers Reading, and The State of the Heart. Patty grew up in Philadelphia as the daughter of a Presbyterian minister, where she learned to value the art of storytelling. Once a pediatric clinical nurse specialist, she now lives in Birmingham, Alabama, and writes full-time. How is Alabama going for you, Patty? Oh, hi, Amber. I'm so happy to be here. It's I, I kept myself off the screen. It's so awkward when you're talking about you and you're just like, okay, okay. <laughs> moving on, yeah. <laughs> okay, moving on. Who cares? Um, it's great. Um, you know, it's the winter weary blahs, but we're all there together. So we'll get to spring. We always do. Mm -hmm. Well, we are looking forward to today. One thing we uh, have learned uh, over our C.S. Lewis Foundation podcast series or webinar series is that we love to hear from our authors and our speakers. So what's going to happen is Patty's going to uh, speak to us for a little while. You can use uh, the Q&A button to uh, type in at any time questions for Patty. It's not going to distract her. She won't have that button open. Mm -hmm. And after she's done, I'll come on the screen, ask her a few questions of my own, and I'll get to some of your questions. And uh, after this webinar is over, we'll have a separate Zoom call where we'll have a discussion group so we can continue talking about the things that we learned. So at any time you can pop in those questions, the q and I'll be moderating that. And we are looking forward to hearing from you, Patty. All right, Amber, thank you for that beautiful introduction and that song. I started singing along with you and then I was like, oh, I have to make sure I'm on mute. <laughs> this is, singing's not, not my thing. Um, thank you, Stephen, for having me and the C.S. Lewis College and Foundation. And Chris, I know you are back there doing the tech like the Wizard of Oz. So thank you for everything, y'all. All right, we are here today to talk a little bit about Joy Davidman. Well, a lot of it. 
and kind of dive into who she was versus the mythology of who she was and to talk a little bit about how she influenced Lewis's life and how she changed him and his work. Um, we're gonna have a great Q&A session, so be thinking about your questions. It's my favorite part, but I'm gonna give you a little bit of background. And I think where I wanna start today, because we're talking with the C.S. Lewis Foundation and not at a book signing or, or, or some party or event, is why fiction? Why did I take this very real person, these very real people, and write what's called historical fiction about them? And if you want to talk about that in the Q&A more about how we can, but the reason I did it is are, are myriad, but the two biggest reasons are number one, that's what I do. I'm a fiction writer. I'm a storyteller. I use fiction to tell the truth, but it's not always the facts, but in historical fiction, that's really important. There is one story there is one story of the improbable love story of C.S. Lewis and Joy Davidman. But even though there's only one story, there are different points of view of that story. And that story has been told. It's been told in Shadowlands. It's been told in other books. It, it's been told in essay. Um, it's been told in that fantastic book by Lyle Dorset in the eighties, but it has never been told from her point of view. And history, if we're ever going to have full stories, history needs to be told from all the points of view and from and, and kind of looking in from all these different facets, we get a fuller truth instead of constantly retelling the mythology of this story. In fiction, we can dig into the emotional truth in a way that isn't quite allowed in straight biography. And I wanted to know joy through story, not through fact. So that is why we have a novel. And I've said it to Stephen before, I've said it to Andrew before, that if I had met or known the C.S. Lewis community before I wrote the book, I probably wouldn't have done it. So I love what I have found with y'all. It has enriched my life in a million ways, but I'm glad I was a bit naive about your existence. <laughs> so, if we should ever grow brave, what on earth would become of us? I wish I had written that, but that is a, straight, a quote straight out of an essay by Joy Davidman. She wrote that quote in a kind of hidden essay that was at the front of her book, Smoke on the Mountain, which is about the Ten Commandments. And when she wrote that essay, the essay was about fear and why we don't trust when Jesus says, do not fear. Why do we fear everything? And, and how apropos is that for today? When he says, do not fear. And she ended the essay thinking, well, if we should ever grow brave, what on earth would become of us? And it, it was like that sentence just jumped off the page for me in this kind of very unknown essay of hers. And I thought, not only was I enamored with her writing, with the actual structure of the sentence, but where she put the words in it, because she didn't say, because we're already brave or God made us brave. She said, if we should ever grow brave. And I, I found that inspiring because when do we ever feel that we've reached the place we want to be? We're always growing. And then what on earth would become of us? And that's where the title of the book came from, Becoming Mrs. Lewis, because in that question is our becoming. And so I rushed through the essay and read it again to try and find the answer to the question that she asked. You figure if she asked the question, she probably answered it, but she didn't. And so I was a bit annoyed, but then I realized that that's because she answered that question with her life. Joy Davidman asked that question and then set out to answer it with her life. So we all fall in love with C.S. Lewis at different times in our life. And if I could see you, I would ask you to raise your hand because if you're here, there was probably a moment in your life when you fell in love with C.S. Lewis or his work, his mind. And I had fallen into mine when I was really young, probably 11 or 12 years old. And as Amber mentioned, my dad is a pastor. So his bookshelves were lined with C.S. Lewis books, like mine are now. And 
I somehow got off the shelf at about 12 years old, the screw tape letters. I highly not recommended reading the screw tape letters when you're 12, but I did. And then of course I fell through the wardrobe door of Narnia. And I might be in love with his work, but there is only one woman that Lewis loved enough to marry. Only one woman that he called earth, stars, air, and water. The exact quote is stars, water, air, and field and forest as they were reflected in a single mind. Her name was Helen Joy Davidman Gresham Lewis. She went by the name Joy, and he, of course, was Clive Staples Lewis, and he went by the name Jack. And Jack and Joy had a decade-long relationship that culminated in this story that has spurred more gossip, more conflicting stories, movies, essays, guesses, and that are told to this day, we are still fascinated with it. And I wanted to tell it in a different way. So this is the story of a fiery woman. And if you know anything of joy, that is an understatement, who heard the cry of her own soul and answered. So why is joy most often remembered if she is remembered at all? There are people who follow Lewis's teachings, who, who quote him, Many of them, as we know, misattributes, but that's a different lecture and a different story. But they know him and they don't know who she is. Or if they do, they just know her as the dying wife of C.S. Lewis. And why is that? I think it's because it's easier to see her as the beloved wife of the man we admire and not look too closely at her complicated and often tragic journey it's easier to hold on to the mythology of her. Years ago, when I read A Grief Observed, the book Lewis wrote after she died, the palpable pain that he felt in her death jumps off the pages. If you've ever read A Grief Observed, especially if you're grieving anything, you know how raw and real those words are. And I thought, what kind of love was this? Who was this poet? Who was this novelist? Who was this woman who so inspired and then broke C.S. Lewis's heart that she could write, he could write a book like that about her? So Joy was a brilliant woman. She was a writer. She was a multi-award winning poet. She was a McDowell artist colony protege. She was an ex-atheist. She was a converted Jew. She was a former communist. She was also married to another writer with two children and living in upstate New York. Meanwhile, C.S. Lewis is an Oxford Don. He is living in Oxfordshire at the Kilns. He is a Christian apologist, a well-known author, and he has never left Ireland or England, except for a brief vacation in France with his mom and then the war, World War I, he was in France. Meanwhile, Joy over here never left New York, born and raised in New York. The only time she left New York was for six months when she wrote screenplays in Hollywood. She said they were the most miserable six months and that she came back to New York kissing sidewalks and subways. And here you have these two people across the ocean from each other, they quite literally couldn't be any different from each other unless they spoke different languages. This was an impossible pairing, and yet it wasn't. Their arrow story contributed to some of C.S. Lewis's greatest works on love, on grief, on the true self behind the veil, on faith, and yet Joy is rarely acknowledged for the muse, editor, best friend, and beloved wife that she was to this revered author. And how often do we get to hear that part of the story? So I wanted to know her. I wanted to write about her. So I started to do my research. And what I discovered was that there were two Joy Davidman camps, right? There was the brash New York woman who inserted herself into Lewis's life. And then there was this fiery, brilliant, genius, sparkling woman that Lewis and Warney describe. This woman who, who could play Scrabble in every language with Lewis, a woman he called Earth, Stars, Air, and Water. 
how was I supposed to meld these two women? How was I supposed to figure out which one she really was? This was a woman who seemed diverse, courageous, complicated. How was I supposed to figure out which one she was? And what I discovered was that Joy often didn't seem to care what other people thought of her, but I did. And I'm sure deep down she did too, but she had, she had a, a very thick armor of, of bon mots and, and, and sarcasm and wit. And she seemed to not care what they thought of her, but I did. So I set out to discover her through her eyes. I decided very early on in the writing that I was going to write this book from Joy's point of view, from behind her eyes, from the, what I called the key of empathy, that I was going to find out as much as one can on this side of heaven, what she felt like. And because she left us so much work and most extraordinarily um, about 10 years ago, a box of unpublished poetry of hers was found in the countryside of Oxfordshire at her dear friend, Jean Wakeman's house. That box held 300 unpublished poems. And among those poems was a folder. And on the top of that folder was written the word courage. And inside that folder were 45 love sonnets to C.S. Lewis. 45 love sonnets to C.S. Lewis. We're not guessing. She says, these are 45 love sonnets to C.S. Lewis. Don W. King at Montreat has put together extraordinary books outlining the, this poetry and these sonnets. But when I started my research, that's where I started because she put her heart on that page. Now, not all of those sonnets were written after she met Lewis. Some of them had been written before she met him but she had compiled them to show the arc of their relationship. So I started my research. I tried to read everything she wrote from her sonnets to her novels, to her essays, to her published letters, to her unpublished letters. I traveled to Wheaton, to the Wade Center, which I feel like is my rabbit hole when I'm there and I'm there with the Downings and I'm there with Elaine Hooker and I'm digging through those files. I feel like, time folds in on itself and I could hold her passport and I could look at her letters and her handwriting. And then I traveled to London and Oxford and I tried to walk in her steps. I organized a trip called In the Steps of Joy. And I walked, I tried to go every single place that you found, that you read about in that novel. And what I found was this extraordinary woman a woman who could read when she was three years old, a woman who wrote for all of her life, a woman who read H.G. Wells and proclaimed herself an atheist when she was eight years old, a woman who won the Yale Younger Poets Award and graduated in a year and a half from Columbia Graduate School with a master's in literature. Her thesis was on Lord Ori. She published her very first novel in her 20s. She was a prodigy genius who could pay, play Chopin by ear. She believed she was the captain of her soul and of her life until she wasn't. In her 20s, Joy married another writer named Bill Gresham. And they had two little boys. And when the little boys were young, Bill Gresham called one night and said that he was not coming home. Bill Gresham had what we would probably today call PTSD from the war, from the Spanish war, um, war. And he, he had threatened suicide before and Joy believed him. And she had two little boys in their cribs. They were babies. She was living in New York and she found herself on her knees. This, she was also a communist at the time, communist, atheist, materialistic woman who believed she was the captain of her soul found herself on her knees. And she says she didn't know why, but something happened when she was on her knees. She said a door opened and it was like love came in. 
She didn't know what else to call it. She says, and God came in and something cracked her open. She said it was only about 30 seconds or less, but everything she believed was put asunder. Her understanding of herself and her world was put asunder in those 30 mystical seconds. She said things like, it was like waking up, that she had taken her life watered down, diluted by space and time. This is a woman who was at the pinnacle of her career and had been to the depths of despair. She said she saw how much energy she had used trying to keep God out. She remembered writing a poem when she was a teenager where she argued with Jesus about his resurrection. And when she looked back, she had written it at Easter. She said, if the knowledge of God was true, the thinking of her whole life had been false. And that's where one of my second favorite quotes of hers comes from, which is she realized that life was too intense to be endured with logic alone. And then she remembered C.S. Lewis's work and she wrote to him. This is 1950. He's famous, but not as famous as, as, as we think of him now. He'd written The Great Divorce, The Screwtape Letters. He'd been on the cover of Time magazine. Um, Narnia had not come out yet. She wrote to him in January of 1950. And The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe came out in November of 1950. But this began a three-year pen friendship with Jack Lewis. Until in August of 1952, she boarded a ship to England to meet her friend, Jack Lewis. For almost three years, they had been writing back and forth each other about faith, about friendship, about life. And they had formed such a bond that when she sailed to England, they already knew each other as much as one can through letters, which is a lot. Now, she did go for a couple of different reasons that you'll read about in the book. But of course, it was also to meet her friend, Jack. And I always say that this is when the story gets really good. And not because it gets easy. This is where the story gets really good because they both have so many obstacles to overcome, both internal obstacles and external obstacles. They have fierce obstacles within themselves and from their societies and from their families and from their friends to ever finally fall into Eros, love and marry. It is a true hero's journey. As if someday she knew someone would want to write this story. She, her emotional transformation from a materialistic atheist to the wife of C.S. Lewis defending the gospel and searching for the truth is the most extraordinary journey. And even if I set out to just write a love story, what I found was something so much bigger. And sometimes we focus on the end result, which is their profound love story. And that's beautiful, we want to, that's what Shadowlands is all about. But there was a journey and I have a whole list of things I think she teaches us, but the number one, one of the biggest things I think she teaches us is that there is the power of story and of writing and of asking the bigger questions. Joy's writing from her award-winning poetry to her novels, to her letters reveals that the entire lifespan she was on a search for the truth. She was saying, there is something real and I want you to show it to me. Show me what's real. Show me what the truth is. She was a lifelong seeker. She looked back and saw that she had been searching in all of her work, all of her work, all of her writing echoing with a very particular longing. She was willing to ask the beautiful questions. She was willing to ask the questions that matter. If we ask better questions, we get better answers. One of my favorite poets is David White. And he says that there is, the beautiful questions are the questions that can make or unmake a life. And I think that's what she did. Joy asked the questions that 
unmade her life. She never stopped using her creative life to sustain her. If she had abandoned it, if she had abandoned her writing, if she had abandoned her curiosity, if she had believed those people who said that her writing and her questions didn't matter in the face of societal expectations, she would have never written that letter to Lewis. She would have never written that poetry. That poetry starts every chapter in my book. She wanted to find something that satisfied her experience, her heart, and her logic. And aren't we all? I think that joy shows us that the search for truth and the search for love with a capital L is worth the convoluted and complicated path of changing our life. So Amber's giving me the high signal. You guys can't see it, but I can. So I'm going to stop talking because I'm dying to hear about some of your questions. Oh, Oh, well, I have a whole page here and I could have like talk all day. <laughs> oh, trust me. I can talk about her all day. I was like, I better check that chat. Well, no, let's keep talking. Cause there's, there's so much here about who she is. Uh, and I, as I was reading, uh, you know, as a 40 year old mother artist as well, I really connected to a lot of how she felt about living in the 40s and 50s and some of those societal expectations. So one of my first questions for you is, you know, this conversion experience, if we could call that 30 seconds in the nursery, yeah. really changed her life, but it started her on a journey yeah. towards faith, right? It wasn't it, like Lewis, it, it wasn't just an overnight, yeah. right. How do you... Uh, um, do you think that her conversion changed some of her views about femininity and motherhood? You know, that was clearly some of the things she was dealing with, but how, how did femininity, motherhood and following Jesus work for her? Parallel wow. paths, integrated paths. I think that, um, wow, that's, that's probably a thesis so uh, I'll, I'll touch briefly on what, what I saw in her. And, and that's that it actually strengthened her belief that we are worthy, that, that women are not less worthy because they're women. But that in Christ, she, one of Joy's biggest struggles was self-worth. Um, a lot of that was, I didn't get into her childhood in this talk, but a lot of that came from her childhood. She had very cruel parents, very strict parents, parents who, who, who you're worth taught her that her worth was based on her performance, mm -hmm. right? So it took her a long while to understand that her worth was in Christ, that it was not in her works. And, and I think from reading her work that she, she was even more firm in her belief that she would never say this, but I am woman, hear me roar, mm -hmm. that I am, I was given this intellect to debate and talk and question. She didn't mind asking anybody anything. Mm -hmm. A lot of those Oxford men did not like that. And, you know, she, she was very, um, I think her faith made her even more firm in her belief of, of the worth of being a woman in Christ. I, I, I don't think it made her feel less and same with being a mother. Mm -hmm. Do you think you brought up the Oxford Dawn versus mm -hmm. brash New Yorker? And mm -hmm. as a woman who lives in New York, who used to live in England, I kind of feel that. Do you, yeah. how did, how did Joy and Jack kind of overcome some of those cultural differences that they had? You know, I don't think in my research, I always have to say in mine, because there are, there are scholars who, who, who can weigh in with, with greater yeah. weight than mine, but I can tell you that of all the reading I did and, and all the letters and all the, the poems and essays that I don't think it was ever an issue between them. Yeah. I think that he was so fascinated by her mind. Mm -hmm. There is a story she tells in a letter where he compliments her by saying that essentially, I'm going to misquote, Andrew Lazo probably has the exact quote, but he'll be on the chat here in a second. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's in a car driving. He's not here, but he is, is essentially, he told her, you know, that she was so great because he, he loved her mind like a man, like a mate, like a buddy hanging out in the pub and, and it hurt her. It really hurt her, but he meant that as a compliment, meaning 
that sharp wit of hers, that sharp mind of hers to him was what drew him forward. Now, as we know, and you'll see in the book, it took him much longer to feel arrows for her. Um, you know, that he, they, they journeyed probably through all four of the loves, which, you know, is arguably until we have faces, but his, his attraction to her in Philia was, was all about her mind. So none of that pushed him away. If anything, it, it, it drew him closer. And we know how deeply Lewis cared for his friends yes. and how his friendship uh, affected so much of his work with the Inklings and um, even his friendships in the war. So it seems natural that he would say, oh, here's another friend, which then took him a long time. Can you speak to that? You know, what, what do you think it was that eventually changed Jack's mind to, uh, or um, what helped him realize he was actually in love with Joy and it was a different friendship than he had with Tolkien or others? I think it was a slow grow. I think it was um, many people say that um, when I talked to Don King, especially and, and Andrew Lazo and, and people who know some of his deeper work, that there came a point where Lewis wouldn't admit it to himself, where other people were saying, well, of course he's in love with her right? His, his yeah. friends were saying it. She could tell, she was telling her friends um, that it was obvious, but he, he wasn't allowing himself. And we could argue back and not argue. We could, we could go around and around about those reasons. They had to do with the virtues. They had to do with their age difference. They had to do with society. They had to do with the fact that she was a divorced woman with two children and, and he was church of England. There was there were many reasons you can't point to one and say that's why he took so long to not only feel it, but then admit it to himself. So he says, if we're going to take him at, at his word and not just his actions, he says in a letter, I think it's to Dorothy L. Sayers. I'm pretty sure um, that sometimes you don't know you love someone until there is an adversary and there is a third and that third is an adversary. And for him, the adversary was death. And so yes. that's when he cracked open. Yeah. Yeah. When death was on the line and imminent. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Oh, we're getting lots of great questions now. Oh, this is lovely. Uh, Barbara Perry. Hello, Barbara asks, Jack struggled with his reason versus his, his imagination. Mm -hmm. Is this something that joy struggled with as well? Oh, I love that question. It's like, it. so I have that when I do the longer talk, I, I talk about how Joy started to notice and that we should look for them in our own lives, these kind of unseen threads that bind us together. And that if we look closely, they're there. If we pay attention, the unseen threads that bind us together are there. And for Joy and Jack, they were innumerable. Um, they were both geniuses and they both struggled with this they were both sight, um, sight memorizers. They were both geniuses. Joy tested when she was a child to the top of the IQ chart. They couldn't test her anymore. Like she hit the top. Um, like I said, she could read at three years old. She graduated from high school when she was 14. And we know Lewis was a genius. So they both constantly struggled with this internal dichotomy between reason and imagination. They were both writers and intellectuals from the beginning of their lives, both of them, and adamant readers, ad, you know, avid readers. They were both atheists who believed only in the material world. She called herself in her essay, um, the world's most astonished atheist. Well, Lewis years later wrote that he was the world's most dejected and reluctant convert in all of England. Mm -hmm. They were both totally fascinated with mythology and, you know, of course, that came out in um, Till We Have Faces. Joy had a lifelong fascination with lions. Um, she used to visit them, sneak out in the middle of the night with her brother and visit them in the zoo. And then Aslan walked into her life. Joy read and was profoundly impacted by George MacDonald. And so, of course, was Lewis. And they both, I love this, they both originally wanted to be poets. Yeah. 
you know, most people don't know that Lewis's first foray into the publishing world was was a poet, poetry book. Yeah. Um, Spirits and Bondage, I think. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. I, I, Clive Hamilton or Clive what was Hamilton. his name? Yeah, yes, yeah. 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 yeah, we just had to talk about that actually in November, which was, that's really fun that you mentioned that. Yeah. yeah. And, and their joy was, you know, an award-winning poet who won the Yale Younger Poets Award. And so th there were all kinds of strings that, that brought them together. But to go back to the initial question, Barbara, absolutely. This, this struggle between reason and imagination, this struggle between truth with a capital T and truth with a lowercase, this struggle between how do I believe a myth that's true? It, 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 was, it was a lifelong journey for both of them. Mm -hmm. Do you have, since you've mentioned their poetry, uh, Anissa has asked, um, well, she says, I believe you were truly destined to write this incredible book, Aww. which is lovely. Thanks, Anissa. Thank you, Anissa. And she asks, uh, do you have a favorite poem by Joy? I do. Um, I actually have two favorite poems. And one is um, her one on spring and where she talks about the blood root out of my heart. And I've tried to memorize it. It's not happening. And then the other one I love is Fairyland, where she mm -hmm. it's a poem that talks about this dream she used to have all the time as a child where she would be walking through the woods and um she'd be on this path and ahead there would be a castle and she would know the way and the grass would turn greener and she'd go this whiny path and then she'd wake up all and she had it over and over again and she mm -hmm. says always the castle we never reached it mm -hmm. and she wrote that poem before her experience on her knees and when she found C.S. Lewis's um, Pilgrim's Regress and read about the island, she realized that her fairy land was his island, which was heaven. And so this poem that she wrote all those years ago took her and led her forward. And so it's, it's one of my favorite poems of hers. Yeah, it's so lovely uh, in the book, how she talks about all of the different uh, strings that have brought them together, like her, her first husband's red the introduction for a book by Charles Williams and, you know, all of the ways that they were connected. Yeah. Uh, Antonia asks a question, uh, in your opinion, how did Joy's life experiences shape her to be the perfect help meet for Jack? And mm -hmm. I think I'd like to add on to that and ask, was she um, a help meet? Is that how you'd say it? Or was she more of a friend? Uh, oh, that's gosh, right. that's so funny. You took the words out of my mouth. Yeah. Um, I, I often say that um, I was tired of hearing about the woman behind the man because she was the woman beside the man. Um, they were, she was more than a helpmate. He was her helpmate too. Like they were, they, they knit themselves together in a way that um, she affected his work he affected her work. Mm. He, you know, he tells the story that he prayed to take her pain and he started having bone pain and she started healing. Right. So, so who's the help me there, right? So, <laughs> so, so there is this, this true eros of, of melding together where, um, but to answer your question, what do I think it was in her, her childhood or in her growing up years? Um, mm. And I think it, it, it was that path that they both took from reason and logic to understanding that life could not be endured with logic alone. And yeah. that and her intellect were, were perfect fits and, as well as her, what avid readers they were, what how much they loved to read. So all of these things mm -hmm. of her childhood and her growing up, you know, just melded perfectly with his, with his interests too. In my yeah. humble. Yeah. <laughs> um, how Nadia asks, this is a lovely question. How has writing this novel and studying Joy's life impacted your own personal journey? I mean, she has changed me. I mean, she has, and, and it's so funny. I keep looking up. There's this, I have I'm a bulletin board across from me. There's a picture of her that was in a newspaper and it's, um, it's her, 
on her lawn chair wrapped in an afghan in 1951 no 19 right before she passed 1957 when she didn't think she had long to live and then she was granted a miraculous reprieve and lived three more years and you know i sometimes i look up from my work and i see her and i just like you're look at you you know like look at you still teaching me stuff um <laughs> I, I, I mean, I have a whole list of things I think she's taught me, but I, the biggest is how I start my talk, which is if we should ever grow brave, what on earth would become of us? I think there is, I mentioned David White before, but he, the poet, but he also has a quote that says, let me be courageous in my terrors. And, and between those two quotes, I, I think the way she's changed me the most is this idea that I don't have to, I, I don't have, I can be scared whether it's the story I'm going to write, the thing I need to say, the task I need to do, the Zoom I have to get on. But um, as we do that, we grow. And, and, and then the other thing she's really taught me is this idea that I talked about in the talk, which is um, asking the beautiful question, that the better the question, the better the answers. And not to be afraid to ask the questions that can make or unmake your life. What, what are some of these beautiful questions? I mean, what were they for joy, but what are they for you? I mean, I think they're the same for all of us in some ways. I think there are universal big questions like, why am I here? Um, what is my calling? What is, what is, who am I made to be? And is that person that I'm made to be, if it's against society's expectations, what do I do about that? Mm. Um, can I leave a situation that isn't good for me, even though everybody tells me to stay? That's her question, not mine. Um, yes. You know, the, the, these bigger questions that, that are hard to ask because you might not get the answer you want. So, yeah. Yeah. Speaking of truth and, and fiction, we have an interesting question. I Oh, I've lost it. Oh, no. <laughs> How do, oh, there it is. Alyssa asks, um, I'd love to hear more about your comment on the truth versus the facts. Okay. Could you unpack that for us in the context of your work and the different goals of these two approaches? So that I think what we're going to, I think what she means, I hope this is what she means is, is what I talked about at the beginning and how I approach historical fiction. And so truth with the capital T is, is, we know what that is, right? So when I approach historical fiction, I look at it this way, that let's pretend it's a person. The skeleton of that person, of the per person you're building must be strong. So the facts are strong and those are true. He was born on this date. He, she died on that date. He wrote published this book on this date. I can't have her talking about The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe when he hasn't even written it yet. Like the facts have to be right. And that's what I mean about the truth versus the facts. Like the facts that the bones of that person or that story have to be solid. And I had timelines all around this office that looked like I was a beautiful mind, that movie, A Beautiful Mind. It was just stickies and notes and um, because that was important to me. And then then there's the skin we're going to put on next, the skin of the story. And for me, the skin of the story is what I call the emotional truth. Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean about a bigger truth, the emotional truth. And because Joy left so much for us, because she left us poems and letters and essays and, and, and unpublished things at the Wade Center, you can, you can search for that emotional truth in what she left behind. And that's the kind of thing that, that is greater than in some ways, the facts that, so that's what I mean by greater than, because that emotional truth isn't a bullet pointed list. It is an emotional journey and a transformation that is the skin of the story. And then the clothes that I put on that person would be what's imagined or I'd prefer inspired, mm -hmm. which is, for example, um, all of the letters between them have been lost. And so to put them in the book, I had to imagine them. But I like to call them inspired because we do have all the letters they wrote to other people during that time. 
Right. So we know what they were talking about. We know what they care about. Then we know the rhythm of their language. Mm-hmm. So even those those book those letters are made up. They're inspired by something bigger, which is the emotional truth of what they were going through in their life at the time. Right. Does that make sense? I hope that's what yeah. she wanted to know. Yeah. Were the letters lost or were they purposefully destroyed? So that's Douglas, my point. So we know. all we I don't know either. So um <laughs> I have to be willing to say, I don't know. We all know that Lewis destroyed his letters. So that's a given. Like there was, Lewis destroyed every letter that was written to him. Um, I can't imagine Joy destroying a single thing that Jack wrote to her. Um, What Douglas has told me, it's in the podcast um, when I interview him, is that he had the letters and that they were in a trunk and that the trunk was in somebody's shed because he had to go overseas and he put this trunk full of stuff in a friend's shed and the shed was vandalized and the letters were gone. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Wow. Right? So I keep waiting for that day where some guy goes, oh, here's you know a cache of letters. Um, I would be so happy. I couldn't even take myself. But they found 300 <laughs> unpublished poems. Who knows what, what, what they'll find next? I don't know. That's right. At Oxford addicts hold an incredible amount of secrets. Yes, yeah. they do. So. <laughs> I know. I'd, I'd love to do an Oxford attic tour, see what we can find. <laughs> I'm glad that you mentioned. Yeah, I know. I'm glad you mentioned Douglas uh, because uh, uh, Robert Jappinga has asked, have you spoken to, to Douglas about this book? Oh, uh, can you tell yes. us about your interview? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, yes, I'm. I I adore Douglas and um, I did not approach him when I was writing the novel. I, um, and and on purpose, um, I told you that I wanted to write it from her point of view, from behind her eyes, from the key of empathy, from her heart. And I made a very deliberate decision um, to write the novel. I did talk to Lyle Dorset and, but then Mm -hmm. I made a very deliberate decision not to interview the family. And of course he's the only one left in the family. Um, But I knew I was going to have to tell him. I mean, obviously I would need some permissions because I start the the chapters with her poetry and all of that. So um, I was just trying to gear up the courage to track him down when he wrote to me. And I know I was so nervous. I got a email that just said, hello, Palti. This is Douglas Gresham. Um, I hear, I was very nervous because all it said was, I hear you have been asking after my mother. So he had talked to my friend Elaine at, at the Wade Center who had told him that I would love to talk to him. Yeah. So um, I called my agent and I said, what do I do? My literary agent. And she said, tell him the truth. I was like, great idea. So <laughs> I, wrote, I wrote back to him and I said, I've written a novel about your mother and I've written a novel to honor her. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I went on and on and um, I waited and there's a bit of a time difference between Alabama and Malta. And the next day I woke up to an email that essentially said Bravo. And then we started writing back and forth. And then I realized he was in America and I said, well, where are you right now? This is a couple of weeks later. And he said, I am in, I think it was, he was in Asheville speaking. Oh. And I said, yep. well, I'm in Spartanburg speaking at a library. Don't move. He said, okay. So I went and met with him for the day and he told me stories and yeah. So I've been communicating with him all this. I mean, I still communicate with him if I find an article or, or whatever, but he has been extraordinarily helpful and also extraordinarily supportive. Yeah. That, and, and he comes off really nicely in the book as yeah. well. So maybe that helps. <laughs> maybe, that helps. maybe it does. <laughs> funny is I'd written him that way before I even met him. I was done with the book when I met him. So yeah. that's funny. That is funny. Um, oh, there's more here. There's more here. Um, there's a couple questions about the comment you made at the very beginning. Uh-oh. If I... I had known the Lewis community. Oh, I no, I wish you said that. <laughs> no, I think it was really honest. I think I, I, uh, it's, it's good. It's good for us to hear these things. Uh, tell us how you feel about that. 
Oh gosh, I love the Lewis community so much. I, when I get asked, what's my favorite thing about writing this book? I say finding y'all. I feel like I found a home that I didn't know I had. When I went, um, I can't believe it was only a year ago when we were all together in Texas. It feels like a lifetime ago. What is time? Where are we? What month is it? I, I don't know. But um, I mean, I felt like in many ways, like, oh, there's my people. Where have they been all this time? Yes. But I think if I had been very involved from the get-go, I, from a scholarly level, like if I had become involved because I wrote a, a, a thesis on him or, or something of the sort, I would have been extremely terrified, more terrified than I already was writing it, to approach this subject. Um, mm -hmm because of the preconceived notions of who she was. And I was able to head into the story, not fully understanding the, some of the preconceived notions of who she was, some of the mythology around mm -hmm. her. So it wasn't necessarily that I'm glad I didn't know the Lewis community. I'm glad I didn't have a lot of preconceived ideas about her that would have kept me from discovering her true heart. Two questions for you, Patty, before we go. One, my very dear friend, Pat, asks, um, your very best guess, do you think Joy had at least any inkling, that's a cute word play there, Pat, yeah. of the consequences of leaving uh, the boys with Bill and Renee? Do you think she could have been hoping that Bill's relationship with Renee might open the window to her freedom. Um, I get asked that a lot. Especially, Do you? Yes, I oh, get asked that. It was kind of a cheeky lot. question. That's why I liked it. <laughs> um, and and my answer hasn't changed through time, but I do think a lot about that. And my answer remains the same, which is, I believe that if she felt that way, it was unconscious. But I'm not saying she didn't feel that way. I, you know, I think that our unconscious thoughts and desires and very Jungian of me to say so, but beneath the, beneath our consciousness, beneath what we think we know about our actions, it's only what we think we know about our choices and actions. And there's this whole iceberg under there of subconscious and unconscious motivations and thoughts and desires that that drive some of the decisions we make. I do not think that she consciously, I also think she was very sick, unwell, not mentally, she was mentally fit, but physically unwell when she finally decided to take this trip. And I think in her conscious mind, she just wanted out. She just needed help and she wanted to meet Jack and she wanted to write this book and she needed to go to Edinburgh and she needed some doctor care and she needed some rest. and. I think she was just so full of all of that, that if that knowledge was there, it was very subconscious. Mm -hmm. And that's what I believe, even after all this time of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. It is interesting how we can look at someone like Lewis and be so changed by his mm -hmm. thoughts, by his ideas, and find so many other people who are so changed by his thoughts and ideas and yet come crashing into the realization that he is just a man yes. who has lived a life like other men who married a woman who lived a life like an extraordinary life, but My had God. desires like other women. And that perhaps like I, I had a dream last night uh, that I showed up in heaven. And who should be sitting over there in the corner of the garden chatting? You know that picture of them where they're both sort yeah. of in the um, chatting. And I thought, who's that? Oh, that's Jack and Joy. I love that. I've never had that dream. I'm very <laughs> envious of that dream. You'll that's probably awesome. have it tonight now. Um, but of course, I was paralyzed because I thought, now what do I do? Do I say anything? I'm going to have to wait 100 years before I can come up with a beautiful question. <laughs> <laughs> By God's grace, they, they are there, just like by God's grace, we are there. Oh, there's one more question I want to ask you by Elizabeth, which I think is really beautiful. 
Um, and perhaps we will close with this and then I'll give some instructions about how to uh, show up at our discussion groups because there's so many more good questions and comments here. I'm so sorry, friends, that we can't get up to all these today. But Elizabeth has asked, earlier you commented about Joy with her parents being valued for her performance, her works as though that were a negative evaluation. Did you say that she sought her value through her relationship with Christ? And then she goes on to say, my challenge is to understand the implication that our works are a reflection of that relationship. She says, you have upended me, please help. Oh gosh, I'm kind of confused by the question. So maybe I'll just clarify what I said instead of what Joy's parents, how they raised her was this idea that ev she was only worthy when she got straight A's. Yes. She was only good when she obeyed, that her, her questions and her curiosities and her fiery spark was bad, mm -hmm. that she was only valued for what they wanted her to be. There are stories of how when she got too hyper, they would lock her out of the apartment and how he tells of her just running around outside screaming to be let in. They... Um, she had a thyroid problem when she was a child and she wore a radium collar you'll read about in the book. And, and he said that, that she would get kind of wired up and they would be like, put on the radium collar. Like she, they, she, she was kind of forced into a mold that, that wasn't who she was made to be. Mm -hmm. And so I think what I was talking about was when she realized her worth in Christ she realized that that her worth wasn't only in her straight A's or her Yale Younger Poets Award or her wit or her intelligence, that it that it came from a deeper place. So it's not that her works don't matter. Oh, gosh. It's that the identity first, the identity matters first. Yes. And and not only that, but the works don't define her worthiness. Right. Right. They just the works are important, but her family had raised her to think that she was only worthy if she had the A, if she won the award, if she was the smartest in the grade. Yeah. I think this is a good word for those of us who are artists, who are mm -hmm. uh, intellects, who are in the academy, that we work hard because we've been given much, but not in order to earn anything from our Lord Jesus Christ. There you go. You said it much better. <laughs> no. Well, I, I have to say it over and over as Joy did, yeah. you know, that, uh, that my worth is in Christ. And I think this is a good place to leave us uh, as we go this month is to remember again um, that we look to Lewis and Jack, uh, Jack and Joy, mm -hmm. uh, in this instance, for their example of how they found their identity in Christ and how that took them through the tumultuous exciting, amazing adventures of the life that they led. Um, mm. But that ultimately that, that brought them peace. So friends, would you please join with me in prayer? Lord Jesus, thank you so much uh, for Patty, for the time that, uh, and the curiosity that she had to look at this person of joy and who she was, how she influenced uh, Jack and all the lives um, that they then touched together. Lord Jesus, I do pray that you would show us, just as you showed joy, how to find our identity in you, how to accept our identity in you, and that all the things that we strive for, all of our interests in the arts and in the academy, all of those things we lay at your feet, we ask for you to work through us. We pray now that you'd bless Patty in her future endeavors and her future writing would the joy of your Holy Spirit come out in her pen and as she works. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. Oh, you made it. There we go. Thank you so much. It's so good to be here with you today. Thank you. I just saw a comment um, that flashed up that said, Patty was great and everything, but Amber, you were the oh. best. <laughs> And you were, and I want to thank you for helping guide the discussion and have me on today. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Chris.
Yes, and it was everybody who showed up. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions. So yes. and thank you to Joshua George, our um, benevolent uh, person today. So thank you so much, Patty. We will see you soon. Bye. Goodbye, see you everybody. Time. Bye.